any event, uh, it is a great pleasure to be here, and uh, uh, I would like to thank the organizers uh, and, uh, for the invitation to come here, for the great weather. Uh, do I need a microphone? Okay, you can bring it to your belt if you want to be fair. Okay. Okay, so um, again, thank the organizer for the invitation. And uh, today, um, um, it is kind of continuation of, of a few things we heard last week on, on, uh, on Friday about uh, superconductor to insulator transition, except that I will try in this talk uh, to go uh, beyond what we have known. Uh, and uh, I actually uh, uh, added uh, this sentence of unveiling the nature of the magnetic field tune superconductor to insulator transition. And I think that you will see what I mean uh, as, this talks, uh, as this talk goes on. Um, this uh, work started uh, with uh, the first student in my group to start it was Elias Dani, went through Nadia Mason, Miles Steiner, and the uh, last one, Nick Bresney. Uh, most of this work that I'll show today is uh, due to him, uh, and of course, uh, uh, lots of other characters uh, help. Um, so I'm going to start. Uh, the starting point is that at strictly zero magnetic field, uh, increasing disorder reduces the costly starless transition to zero. This was uh, first uh, uh, introduced by uh, uh, Beasley, Mui, and Orlando. Uh, but then in the presence of magnetic field with this order, superconductivity exists only at t equal to zero. Now, I said this is a starting point. Let me pause for a minute uh, and, and tell you a bit, uh, well, show you uh, my starting point of, of acquaintance with, with Boris. Um, I met Boris first in 89. Uh, this is a picture of the two of us uh, in, in Leningrad. The Hermitage is behind us. Um, so uh, we go. Sorry? Marinsky Theater, okay. <laughs> Whatever. It's the same color. The building has the same. Okay. Uh, we have several pictures. Um, I, I'm not going to ask who is who. Um, I think that at that time, <laughs> at that time, at that time, at least, at least some people said that we look alike. Um, so um, I'm going to continue uh, beyond this uh, other starting point on uh, the the talk. I'll, I may come back to it later. Um, so we are talking about the the uh, superconductor to insulator transition, and since we are. Uh, talking about the fact, and especially I'm going to concentrate on a finite magnetic field, uh, that the only uh, possible phase exists at, at, zero, at zero temperature, uh, then we are talking about a quantum phase transition. Now, uh, obviously, I should not forget that uh, uh, the first introduction of, of a uh, disorder tuned quantum phase transition uh, uh, came with the work of Alan Goldman. But as I said, um, I find it... Uh, uh, more especially uh, as an experimentalist in the lab, uh, you make one film, you have one realization of this order, and therefore the magnetic field tune superconductor to insulator transition uh, is, is uh, I find, uh, easier to, to understand. So I'm going to concentrate on that, which means that every film that I measure in the lab, or my students measure, uh, means a different realization of this order, and it's going to cut this uh, zero temperature superconductor to whatever insulator transition uh, at some point. That's the quantum phase transition. Uh, the first uh, discussion of, of this problem was by uh, Hebbard and Palanen in 1990 with the, their Fizrev letter, and I'll come back to it in a minute. So we are talking about the magnetic field tuned superconductor to insulator transition, and of course, I can destroy superconductivity, global superconductivity, in two ways, either uh, by, by uh, amplitude-dominated scenario, in which simply I break Cooper pairs altogether as I cross the line, 
or I uh, can think of maintaining the character of the Cooper pairs uh, and only uh, break the phase. This is very similar, if in fact, to what happens near the costerless taurus transition. Of course, there is just one transition, that's the costerless taurus transition, but you can still talk about vortex anti vortex pairs that bind at the KT transition if you are close enough to that transition. So, in that same spirit, uh, we can talk about just breaking the phase. Uh, and maintaining Cooper pairs, if you want, going through this transition. And in fact, if you do a very simple calculation uh, of the energy scale for phase fluctuations in two dimensions, especially films of the type that I'm going to measure, you find that the scale for phase fluctuations is so low that probably this is the dominating uh, scale for this transition. So we are talking about uh, a phase-dominated superconductor to insulator transition uh, in which the cast of characters are the Cooper pairs, associated with the Cooper pairs are the vortices, uh, and since uh, we are talking about going from um, a, a superconductor in which Cooper pairs are delocalized and being a superconductor, the vortices need to be localized, uh, then the insulator is where the Cooper pairs are localized and the bosons will be delocalized, eventually maybe uh, bos condense. Uh, the the uh, 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 point separating the two phases uh, will be therefore uh, a metal and if it's characterized by bosons, it's gonna be a Bose metal. Talking about the quantum phase transition, I'm approaching it from a finite temperature. All our measurements are done at a finite temperature, looking at the quantum phase transition, uh, and therefore, um, uh, unlike a classical phase transition, we just uh, um, uh, governed by uh, a diverging length uh, due to thermal fluctuations, uh, here I need to supplement it with the dynamics. I will have some uh, 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 vanishing frequency uh, that is related uh, to the diverging uh, correlation length uh, via this uh, 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 so-called dynamical exponent. Uh, but then, since I am measuring at a finite temperature, uh, this, is this vanishing frequency is going to be cut off by KT. And therefore, uh, it defines uh, a, a range of attraction of the quantum critical point. And I will come back to that because this is a central part of this talk today. Um, so, uh, scaling analysis for this transition was uh, first written down uh, by uh, Matthew Fisher. Uh, you have a diverging length. I'm going to tune the superconductor to insulator transition using a magnetic field. Uh, so, the, the correlation length will diverge as I approach the critical field. Uh, the vanishing frequency uh, is going to be uh, uh, given with the dynamical exponent z. However, uh, being cut off by kt, uh, uh, it now have your competition between these two lengths, uh, which then uh, uh, a scaling function emerges uh, in which there is an amplitude uh, and then a scaling function of this reduced parameter. It's basically the, 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 the ratio of these lengths. You can rewrite it uh, as H minus HC divided by this temperature to one over Z nu. Uh, similarly, uh, if you are not too low temperatures, uh, you can also uh, uh, use an electric field to tune the transition. Uh, and uh, in that case, the energy, uh, the, the vanishing frequency uh, is going to be cut off by the electric field, uh, and you'll get another, uh, another uh, 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 scaling function. Uh, now, with respect to the electric field across the sample, uh, in fact, if you measure these two, then you can get z and nu separately. We did that a long time ago, and then it was repeated in the quantum hall uh, uh, as well. Now, what are the hallmarks, therefore, of this quant uh, uh, superconductor to insulator transition? Um, well, if I am at a temperature which is much below the, the, the uh, pairing temperature, I am at low enough temperatures, then the only thing that matters is uh, 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 how am I with respect to the quantum critical point, call it the superconductor to insulator transition. And if we look at the original data of... Uh, of uh, Hebbard and Palanen, uh, then we can separate an insulating behavior from a superconducting behavior and a separatrix at which the uh, uh, resistance does not change as you lower uh, the temperature. Um, now, if I use that scaling function, it means that uh, if I am at that critical field, looking at isotherms now, uh, then there is going to be a crossing point because at HC, uh, the, the argument here is zero, independent of temperature, well, that's the original data of Hebbard and Palin. It's not a very good crossing point, but more recent data of many other groups 
uh, have much, much better data with much better crossing point. And the critical resistance should be of order of the quantum of resistance uh, for Cooper pairs, which is h over 4e squared. Uh, now, um, the, the uh, uh, critical exponent, z and nu, uh, well, we'll talk about it uh, later, but uh, um, for the uh, universality class of that, that was, was discussed in this quant quantum superconductor to insulator transition, uh, we expect uh, z equal 1 and nu equal to two po about 2.3. Uh, but again, I'll come to it later. Um, so the original results of Hebbard and Palanen uh, were um, uh, looking at some average uh, point as the crossing point, then scaling the data according to this scaling function, uh, finding that there are two branches above and below the critical field, uh, extracting this z times nu of 1.3. Okay. Um, now, uh, further work uh, done in, in my group was trying to distinguish weak and strong disorder. Um, and uh, the idea is that if I look at this phase diagram, indeed there is weak disorder, which is closer uh, to the abricosov lattice at strictly zero disorder, uh, versus uh, strong disorder, which is uh, closer to the disappearance of, of uh, superconductivity as you increase uh, disorder. So uh, the question is whether it's the same universality class in, or the same behavior uh, in all these uh, range of magnetic field. Uh, and uh, it turned that it's not. You can distinguish weak disorder uh, in which there is an apparent uh, critical point, but the magneto resistance, magneto resistance, of course, will tell you how insulating you are because you are increasing the magnetic field, so you are going through the superconductor to insulator transition. You expect the resistance to diverge if it is indeed an insulator. And for weak disorder, we find that this is not uh, a very strong insulator. On the other hand, similar to, uh, um, in fact, identical to the work uh, shown by Danny Shachar on, on, uh, on uh, Friday, uh, strong disorder uh, give you gigantic magneto resistance. Uh, here I stopped at 200 millikelvin. You'll see why uh, soon. But uh, you go to lower temperatures uh, and you find those uh, mega ohms, I mean, those giga ohms. Here we are already at at uh, uh, one and a half mega ohm at 200 millikelvin, and it gets uh, larger, and it gets to some other effects uh, that we heard before. Now, the interesting thing is that when you get to the strong disorder, then the critical resistance is very, very close to h over 4 e squared. As an experimentalist, it's, it's very difficult to determine it exactly, because although the resistivity in, in two dimensions is dimensionless, uh, when you go to the lab, uh, you still need to divide by the number of squares, so you need to know where the current flows. Uh, so there are always about 10% uh, variations of that. So um, the weak disorder, what we found, uh, is in fact intervened by the appearance of metallic phases. Uh, and by now we looked at uh, many, many samples in, uh, in, in, in our lab and others in, in, in other uh, uh, materials. I will not discuss the, these metallic phases uh, today. Uh, this was the original data on moly germanium. You see that the, the uh, uh, insulating is a very weak insulator. Nevertheless, you can uh, do scaling in some range of, of, uh, of temperatures and fields. Uh, again, I told you similar data on tantalum nitride, uh, indium oxide. Uh, all these have very weak magneto resistance. And then there is this appearance of metallic phase that then gives way to a true superconducting phase at, at uh, lower magnetic field. I'm not going to talk about that today. I don't have time. I will talk only about the strong disorder regime and only on experiments done on indium oxide. And I'm talk about uh, this, which was the title of this possible whole insulator phase uh, in this regime. Uh, in all these cases that I'm going to talk about, uh, the critical resistance uh, is uh, very, very close to h over 4 e squared. Uh, just like this example I showed you before. And if you do scaling near this critical point that you cannot even see it because uh, it's at about six and a half kilo ohm versus we are here already at one and a half mega ohm, uh, then you get a beautiful scaling uh, with very small reduced parameter uh, with z nu of order of two and a half. Okay, I'll come back to this number. Again, similar data was shown by Danny Shachar from his group, Tatiana Baturina, obtained on, on uh, chlorinated uh, uh, titanium nitride. Uh, so this has been seen, in fact, 
uh, by other groups, but in very small number of materials, only in the homoxide and this chlorinated titanium nitride. Okay, so uh, in fact, you can uh, collapse all the data we found uh, um, in, in these, uh, if you simply look at the critical resistance uh, or conductance divided by 4e squared over h, and you look at very low fields, extract the slope of, of uh, resistance versus magnetic field, extract hc2 from that, and divide your critical field by that hc2, then all the data, uh, this is now on tantalum nitride, molygermanium, indium oxide, and, and tantalum, um, that's uh, those that did all these uh, measurements of, of scaling, etc. Then I find that uh, there is a regime of very weak disorder, uh, and in that regime we find these metallic phases. However, in the strong disorder regime, we always find that the critical resistance is very close to h over 4e squared, and that if we do scaling, uh, you get this critical exponent very close to about two and a half. So, I'm now going to concentrate on the magnetic field tune transition and supplement all these longitudinal resistance measurements that have been done since 1990 uh, with Hall effect measurements. Now, Hall effect measurements were done first by, again, Hebbard and Palanen in 1992, and from 1992 until the uh, uh, preprint we put on the archive uh, a few months ago, uh, there are no measurements of the Hall effect um, uh, near the superconductor to insulator transition. And the reason actually, actually is very, very simple. Uh, well, look in Hebbard and Palin, and this is intermediate disorder, I would say. I mean, you can see that already at, at about 50 millikelvin, the resistance increased only by a little. Uh, what they find is that still uh, the Hall effect starts to be finite above the superconductor to insulator transition. And uh, above a higher field, the Hall effect starts to splay. In fact, when they do high resolution Hall effect, they find kind of a crossing point, similar to what they find here. Okay? Um, so this is peculiar, and for some reason, nobody picked up on that. But we know why. And there are lots of people still that are reluctant to measure this Hall effect. And the reason is that uh, we already saw that in those very uh, strong disorder uh, films, uh, then the resistance is enormous. Now, you know how you measure Hall effect in the lab. You measure field up, field down uh, from, from a, a, a sample that, that has the Hall bar on opposite side. You subtract, divide by two, you have the Hall angle. There you have the Hall effect. But you can do that only uh, if the, the longitudinal resistance is small because of contamination. You can never really align these uh, especially if there are also uh, inherent inhomogeneities in the material, either because you made it or because they appear there. So there is a problem. Well, we solved it long time ago uh, with, with Alec Palevsky in, in the lab in Tel Aviv uh, in, when was it, 1876, something like that. Um, and, and, but only partially in order to extract Hall effect from, from large resistance uh, samples, but this is still not enough. But then, Maybe this is not important. And I think this is probably uh, one of the, or the, 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 the next two, two uh, imp most important slides uh, from, of, of this talk. If we believe that there is a quantum critical point at zero temperature, then, and we are at temperatures much smaller than uh, the pairing temperature, namely, all the particles are already well defined, the vortices and the, and the Cooper pairs, then it doesn't matter at what temperature I am. In fact, zero temperature, from the point of view of zero temperature, five millikelvin, 20 millikelvin, 100 millikelvin, or in some cases uh, that were discussed in high TC, 100 kelvin, it doesn't matter. Zero temperature, for z from the point of view of zero temperature, these are the same as long as I'm within the range of attraction of the quantum critical point. So, the whole point is, why won't I stay at high temperatures, try to be within the quantum critical point, and therefore avoid this inability to subtract the longitudinal uh, effects, as well as, as we saw on Friday, there are non-equilibrium effects that appear at lower temperatures. But again, 
these non-equilibrium effects uh, appear at some temperature, I'm going to stay, as, as you remember from the, 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 uh, the IDVs, I'm going to stay at higher temperatures where the non-equilibrium effects do not appear yet. If I am within the range of attraction of the quantum critical point, I will not know about them. Okay? And this is the philosophy of this talk. And I think that what basically, uh, 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 why people were reluctant to measure it is because they said, oh, this is a zero temperature quantum critical point. I need to go to as low temperatures as possible to measure the whole effect. Otherwise, I cannot say anything about it. But uh, you cannot do it. You cannot measure at low temperatures the whole effect. I can guarantee you the longitudinal resistance is too, is too high. So I'm going to stay at higher temperatures and show you data and show you what one can extract from this kind of point of view. So here is uh, some data from one sample. Uh, there is the, the uh, critical resistance of the superconductor to insulator transition. And this is the whole effect. And just like in Hebert and Palanen, you see now I'm staying at higher temperatures. okay? And you see that there is a separation. There is a crossing point. Maybe I chose the wrong colors. Um, kind of a crossing point because it's a crossing point of splaying, namely that, that the, the divergence above that, that the whole crossing point is much stronger than below. And then uh, and that's the original result of Hebert and Palin. This is a much stronger uh, insulator. They appeared, they, they had that at, at, at 50 millikelvin with the same TC. We have it at, at uh, 200 millikelvin, uh, as, as I said. Here is another sample. This one we did. Especially, I mean, we, had, we have actually several such samples. We went to the magnet lab to measure at very high temperatures. We, want to, we wanted to make sure that all vestiges of superconductivity and pairing are gone so I can measure the actual carrier density by, at, at the low temperatures by simply looking at the slope of the whole effect. Okay? So, first of all, here is you take one of the samples. You do scaling. This is the scaling with the, with the uh, uh, temperature. This is the scaling with the electric field, providing, again, there is another reason for the high temperature. I can avoid this, this uh, heating effect that may appear if I am at too low temperatures, So, uh, which is, by the way, something I discussed with Boris a long time ago. He, the first thing he said, hey, did you make sure that you are not heating? Well, we are not. And uh, you can see that you can do this scaling. Uh, these are the two exponents that you, that you have. You solve this, you get that nu is about 2.3 and, 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 and z is 1. And, and every sample in which the, the critical resistance is of order of 6.5 kilo ohm shows that. And, and, and that's it. Now I'm going to show you the whole effect. And I'm going to show you the limit of t equal to 0. So I'm taking now a cut goes all the way to t equal to zero, okay, this is increasing, this is decreasing temperature. This is decreasing temperature on the insulating side, decreasing temperature on the, on the um, uh, superconducting side. I'm going to show you the limit of t goes to zero of the whole effect. This is it. Now, there is another very important uh, thing that we could do once we have the whole effect. You can invert the resistivity matrix and obtain sigma xy as well as rho xy. So I'm going to have rho xx, rho xy, and sigma xy. And look what you see here. Sigma xy, I mean, start rho xy seem to be zero, just like Heban and Palin, and all the way to the SIT, then it starts to increase. This is the limit of t goes, of, uh, t goes to zero. Then there is a point, which is the point of the crossing point of the whole effect, in which the whole resistance has a break. OK? That's, this appears roughly at the peak of the magneto resistance. I will interpret that as going to the fermion regime. After all, we measure in, in other samples all the way to very high fields. I'll, I'll, uh, the interesting thing is that, that at that point, exactly, the rho xy is exactly h over nec, which is, I find, quite interesting. So you see, the whole, the whole resistance on the insulating side goes from 0 all the way to H over NEC, which is the classical limit, and then it breaks and goes up beyond that, which I will, I will interpret as wants to be an insulating. It's just that in an insulating system, both rho xx and rho xy uh, go to infinity. Rho, x, rho xy will go slower. 
Now, uh, let me zoom near the superconductor to insulator transition. Now you see it even better. Rho, X, rho XY is zero below the transition and starts to be finite above. Sigma XY, which we inverted the matrix, is zero above the transition. And then, now, uh, both were, by the way, uh, scaled with rho with h over 4 e square and sigma with 4 e square over h. So they are both dimensionless in the same way. And what you see is that you can easily have the same straight line going through both of them through the transition. You go from rho to sigma. Of course, there is more scatter in sigma because we are inverting, we are inverting a matrix. But, but otherwise, I think it's quite evident. And the lowest temperature, which temperature? 200 millikelvin. Um, so so uh, actually, I think that there, there is some of the data goes to 100 millikelvin. But, but most of the data that I'm showing is down to 200 millikelvin. Uh, you go, you certainly if you go uh, below 100 millikelvin, you start to see uh, non-equilibrium effects. I, I, in this talk, and I gave the rationale, I'm avoiding this. Well, but the is still like that. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so that's basically what I meant by taking the same straight line and going through. Well, this is a manifestation of cell duality. There is no, there is no other way to explain that. Um, so let's take a field in between now, in between these two crossing points, rho xx and rho xy, say six tesla, for example, in this case. Look, rho xx diverges. Rho xy is finite. Well, there is a name for such a phase in which rho xx diverges and rho xy is finite. It's called Hall insulator. This name was first invented by uh, uh, Kivelson, Lee, and, and Zhang in their global phase diagram of the quantum, of the, uh, quantum Hall effect uh, paper of 92. The interesting thing is that at the edge of this, of this uh, range, uh, the rho xy is h over NEC, which is the quote unquote canonical value for a, 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 a whole insulator. And all this, this, this is, I, I mean, this is not, there's no any massaging of the data. I'm showing you raw data, uh, and, 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 except that sigma xy was inverted from the raw data without smoothing, without anything. This is what we have. Um, so, you know, you have an insulating uh, behavior of rho xx, finite rho xy, self-duality, as I showed you uh, from here. Well, if you have self-duality and this is a whole insulator, well, we have to call this side the superconducting side, we have to call vortex insulator. It has the exact same uh, behavior. Uh, so if here you are dominated by rho xy of the Cooper pairs, then here you have to be dominated by sigma xy of the vortices. Well, it's quite interesting that if you are imposing now self-duality, so um, uh, you are uh, in duality between vortex and Cooper pairs, then the relation between the, the conductivity tensor uh, is like that with the resistivity tensor of vortices, and similarly uh, for resistivity versus conductivity of vortices. Self-duality at the transition implies uh, that uh, sigma xy at hc is zero and rho xy at hc is zero. As I showed you, we find experimentally. Well, I already uh, discussed the fact that sigma xy, well, the fact that rho xy is finite, that's a whole insulator, that's just like in the quantum hole liquid to insulator transition. But now, uh, this idea that sigma xy on the superconducting side, I just showed you, has to be dominated, well, originated from vortices. You invert uh, the matrix. Uh, you get that uh, it is uh, 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 rho xy vortex over rho xx vortex square plus rho xy vortex square, normal inversion. But on the superconducting side, of course, the vortex resistivity goes to infinity. Um, so it's roughly that, which means that rho xy vortex over rho xx vortex square is finite because of sigma xy vortex being finite. But this relation was obtained previously uh, in the general case by Vinokur et al., which was quite interesting. But I believe that, that this is maybe the most uh, starting manifestation of, of, this, of this relation. So previously observed whole insulator phase, uh, this was observed in the quantum hole liquid uh, to insulator transition. Um, 
It was predicted in the global phase diagram by uh, Kivelson et al. Uh, it was discovered in, in a quantum hole. Uh, these are just examples. I mean, here are some examples of, of uh, quantum hole liquid to insulator transition near nu equal a third, nu, near nu equal uh, two. In both cases, you do scaling and you get z nu equal to, well, they measured uh, one over z nu, fine, but you invert you invert uh, uh, their point, uh, point 0.43 for 1 over z nu, you get 2.3. Very similar to what we obtain in this strong disorder regime. Um, and indeed, what they find for the uh, whole insulator is that the rho xy is, is b over nec, which is this limiting case before we transition into what I will call a, a Fermi uh, metallic phase. Um, duality was also observed before, and I give you one example here of, of the group of, of uh, um, uh, Dan Tsui and, and Mansur Shagan. Dan Shachar was the student at that time. Uh, they looked at the symmetry of IV characteristics, and indeed they said that this result can be interpreted as evidence for the existence of charge flux duality symmetry in the system. Well, we showed it through the whole effect, which I believe is a more, is a more straightforward way to show it, uh, but we do find self-duality as well. So we have whole insulator and we have self-duality, and it looks very, very much like the quantum whole liquid to insulator transition. So um, one can then get uh, insight into the quantum whole liquid, uh, into the superconductor to insulator transition from what we know about uh, uh, quantum whole liquid to insulator transition. I showed you that all the characteristics, including scaling, uh, are very much the same. Well. Um, um, I, I don't have time to discuss that because I was told that. But you can cook out models uh, that, that uh, uh, in fact, there are inherent inhomogeneities, just like in the quantum hole liquid, uh, I believe, uh, first uh, was introduced, um, uh, the percolation, the quantum percolation uh, uh, model was first introduced by Choker and Coddington. Uh, and, and you can basically understand the superconductor to insulator transition in the exact same way. Uh, there is always uh, uh, inherent inhomogeneities, whether you started with a granular system or you started with a homogeneous system, disordered, of course. We are tuning disorder, and then there is always amplification of the disorder when it comes to superconductivity. And you have a granular system. You have something uh, that, that quantum percolation should be a very good description for. Uh, and then it could very well be that you are... Uh, uh, your self-duality comes from these typical junctions, and you know self-duality in a in a Johnson junction is is something uh, trivial. Uh, if for every so so you look at the current, uh, and then you look at the voltage associated with vortices traversing uh, the junction, uh, and then if for every Cooper pair goes through, there is a vortex going going uh, across, uh, then you can calculate the resistance. You find that it is h over 4 e squared times this uh, 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 ratio of rates. But if these rates are the same, uh, as I just demonstrated, you get h over 4 e squared. So I believe that these inhomogeneities, which are then, then means you are dominated by this kind of, of junctions, uh, are, are behind that, that uh, uh, story. Now, to conclude, this is the phase diagram that we see if we stay above uh, the non-equilibrium line. We see a quantum critical point at zero temperature, uh, which we will call uh, 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 a, a transition from a superconductor. We call it now a whole insulator because we identified the phase, the insulating phase. Um, and, and uh, well, let's just look at that without the intervening uh, non-equilibrium effects. Um, and then there are two possibilities. You know, uh, we said that, that uh, in fact, yeah, our whole effect goes uh, from zero above the uh, superconductor to insulator all the way to H over NEC, above which, if I'm in a thermodynamic limit and I'm at a low enough temperature, we expect both rho x x and rho x y to diverge like a normal insulator. But in this range in between, we expect the rho x y to be finite. I'm still not ruling out the possibility uh, that, uh, in fact, uh, rho x y, uh, that we see it going all the way up, well, maybe it's going to get, <laughs> as I lower the temperature, and again, if I could switch off non-equilibrium effect, it will then go down again, but in that case, it's going to be a quantum, a, a, a quantized whole insulator with rho x y equal to zero. Either one 
it is still a whole insulator phase. Um, but our data definitely show that the, whole ins the, the, the insulating phase above the superconductor to insulator transition is a whole insulator phase. And at the transition, there is uh, self-duality. Both uh, were never, uh, in fact, seen before and demonstrated before for this system. So these are the conclusions. I, I just repeated myself so you can read them. Uh, and uh, let me go back to the starting point, uh, which is 89 in Leningrad. This is now, just a few days ago, here in Trieste. So I think that in, what, 26 years, I'm going to show only this picture uh, without this picture. This is going to be our what birthday? Uh, 86. So happy birthday, boys. And thank you all.